In the previous section, we saw that um, a standing wave that arrives at the fixed end of a string must always have a node at the fixed end. In this section, we're going to have a look at um, what happens when we have a string that's fixed at both ends. So here we have a string fixed at both ends, a bit like a violin string or a guitar string. What happens if this string is disturbed or plucked is that we get waves of all kinds of frequencies traveling out in both directions. However, most of these frequencies very quickly cancel out and die down, and only certain frequencies will produce standing waves that resonate in that string. And the reason for this is that only certain very particular wavelengths satisfy the condition of having a node at both ends. And we'll have a look at what those particular standing waves look like. So the first of these is called the first harmonic. In this simulation, they use a different terminology. They call it the fundamental. We'll call it the first harmonic. And the first harmonic looks like this. This is the resultant wave produced by two waves traveling in opposite directions. Um, however, in this simulation, we're only seeing the resultant wave of those two. And what we should be able to see here is that these two waves, this, this wave, sorry, um, has exactly as a wavelength that is equal to exactly twice the length of the string. But what we can see here is half of a sine wave, the other half um, uh, we just have to imagine, so that the wavelength is, is twice the length of the string. That's the lowest um, frequency um, standing wave that can fit on the string, the longest wavelength frequency that can, sorry, the longest wavelength standing wave that can fit on the string. So this is called the first harmonic, um, and this is the, this is the um, frequency that determines the pitch of the sound. If you want to figure out what the pitch of a sound on a guitar string is, for example, you need to figure out what the first harmonic frequency is. This is not the only standing wave that will form on a guitar string. So there are other waves that also satisfy the boundary condition of having a node at each end. However, these waves are shorter, and these are the higher harmonics. So the second harmonic has exactly half the wavelength of the first harmonic. So now, whereas in the first harmonic we had a half a wavelength fit on the string, we now have a whole wavelength fitting on the string, which means that the wavelength is only half of what it used to be for the first harmonic. And it also means that the frequency is exactly double that of the first harmonic. Uh, similarly, we can show that the third harmonic has a wavelength that is only one-third of the first harmonic, and therefore a frequency that is three times the first harmonic. The, wa the wave speed in all these situations remains the same, because we haven't changed the properties of the string. The string still has the same tension and the same mass per unit length, so we, the speed of the wave remains the same, which means that the frequency and the wavelength have an inverse relationship. The fourth harmonic has exactly one quarter the wavelength of the first harmonic, and therefore exactly four times the frequency of the first harmonic. So one thing, uh, just a little summary, um, the, this is a, a typical harmonic that can be formed on a string fixed at both ends. It has a node at each end, those are the boundary conditions, and it then has a series of antinodes and nodes along the string. Um, when we actually pluck a guitar string, all of these harmonics are present, and so that forms what looks like quite a complex wave, but it's really just the superposition of all of these individual harmonics. So we'll have a look at what that might look like. So different instruments emphasize different harmonics differently. So I'm just going to pause this, and we're going to have a fundamental. Oh, it doesn't like pausing. So maybe we have a fundamental that is that amplitude. We have a smaller second harmonic, and we have a large third harmonic, and somewhere in the middle for the fourth harmonic. And so the actual wave that's produced on the string looks like a much more complicated beast than the 
any of the individual harmonics. But it's this combination of all of the possible harmonics on the string that produces the characteristic sound of that particular string of the instrument. So um, that's a summary of how harmonics work on a, a string that's fixed at both ends. Um, that last aspect, the fact that we have different combinations of harmonics on different instruments, is uh, sometimes referred to as the uh, timbre of the string or the quality of the, the quality of the note produced by the string. We just saw how various harmonics in a string can produce uh, different qualities of the sound. So in, when we pluck a guitar string, for example, we don't only get the first harmonic. Uh, the first harmonic does determine the pitch, but um, there's more to a sound than just the pitch and the volume. Um, we get the, a whole lot of higher harmonics kind of superposed on that first harmonic, which, um, which produce the characteristic quality of that sound. And we saw the same thing when, uh, when Niha and Su sang the same C note in class. It was a middle C that we found by, by um, striking a tuning fork. And so what we saw when we recorded Niha's voice is we got the presence of all of these, uh, of the, these higher harmonics we have the um, middle C, which is at 256 hertz down here. That's the first harmonic. Now, you can see that we also have the second harmonic at exactly twice the frequency of the first harmonic. And that one has a smaller amplitude. The third harmonic has a very large amplitude. The fourth harmonic has a slightly smaller one. The fifth has a, has a larger one. The sixth has a smaller one. Um, so the, this, is, this is the um, note um, that is produced, a combination of higher harmonics that's produced when Niha sings middle C. Uh, we then asked um, Su to sing the same note, and Su's voice produced a very different looking graph. Um, she still had the first harmonic, but uh, that had a very small amplitude. So the first harmonic, remember, determines the pitch of the sound, and that's at 256 hertz. She had a second harmonic that was slightly larger than the first, and a very large third harmonic, and then a smaller fourth, a smaller still fifth, sixth, seven, uh, seventh, and so forth. Um, and so this, um, while it's still the same note, and it was sung at approximately the same, um, the same loudness, um, it has a very different sound, and we, we can very quickly identify the difference between Niha's voice and Su Kyung's voice. Um, because of the of the different quality of the sound, um, um, which is determined by the combination of, of higher harmonics and the different amplitudes of the higher harmonics. Um, okay, so and that that's also incidentally why we can distinguish between the the notes produced by different musical instruments. So we can we can play the same note at the same loudness on a on a guitar and a mandolin, and we can very quickly hear we can immediately hear. Um, which, which instrument is which, uh, because of the different higher harmonics that are emphasized.